Hello and welcome to Racecraft again. This will be part two of our Scorpion build. This is the, the second one. So uh, in this one we're going to talk about problems with the diff. We'll get the motor ready to go in, uh, paint the engine bay and all that sort of thing. So let's get on with it. I've got the radius rod bracket in and that's our radio support panel there. So I'm going to weld this in, then I'm going to pop the radio support panel in. So just going to do a little welding in, in, uh, in the corners here, and I'll show you what it looks like when it's all in. All right, now for the next bit. So I've got the radius rod bracket bar in there. I've just bolted the radiator support panel and there's three little bolts on there. They're only there just to hold it in position until I weld it in. So I'll weld that in completely now and that'll be that part of it done. But I will talk to you a bit later about the legals and everything of cutting the original radiator support panel out because there seems to be a lot of confusion about what you can and what you can't do. Well, the paint has finished our engine bay for us. Looks, looks pretty good. We've bolted a few of the parts back in again. Uh, we've got the booster bolted in. We painted that white as well because it sort of blends in rather than having this big black thing sitting there. We also painted the charcoal canister. Charcoal canister has to be there because that's part of the regulations. Now, speaking of regulations, I've looked at a couple of the forums and looked at some of the misinformation that's out there about cutting the radiator support panel out of your original car and people are saying oh no no you can't do it one i remember reading a comment there by one guy saying that his engineer freaked out because he cut trimmed it a little bit well if you look up vsb 14 vsb 14 stands for vehicle standards bulletin 14. if you google that what will come up will be the National Code of Practice for Modification of Light Motor Vehicles. Now, what's important about that is that it is the National Code of Practice. It's not just the Queensland Code of Practice, that is the National Code of Practice. And if you read through that, if you go to the LA2 section, which is the section deals with the high performance engine conversion, you will see that there's a checklist there. And the checklist looks like that. Now, in this checklist, when you go down to strength, has the engine been fitted without alteration to the vehicle's chassis, subframes, cross members, or body members? If not, has the alteration been performed in accordance with section LH body and chassis? So even your checklist tells you that yes, you can, but if you do, you've got to put the panel in, in accordance with LH body and chassis section. Now, when you go down, when you scroll down and you find LH, when you read through that, it even tells you what thickness of material you're supposed to use. And bigger is not always better. Um, I did see photos on one of the forums, a guy with a panel similar to that, and it looked like it was made out of six more plate. That's actually overkill. It's not only overkill, it's not actually within the rules. The rules say that you can't go any more than two and a half times the original thickness. That's why this is quite thin, but the bar here that supports the radius rod brackets is two and a half millimeter, uh, sorry, three millimeter wall thickness material, because that's about the same thickness as that part of the original cross member was. So yes, you can cut it and you can put in a new radiator support panel. So I'd just like to put that to rest. Anyway, we're going to get on with this now. We'll get the motor and gearbox mounted in there. We'll put the radiator in and so forth. And uh, we'll come back to it when it's a bit further along. This car came here with the nine inch diff already in it, where you put the top arms in, but when I lowered the car down to get it to right height, 
we ended up with a really ugly pinion angle. The pinion's actually pointing down towards the ground by about five degrees. So that's, that's pretty unacceptable. The diff conversion's a really nice job. It's just a shame the brackets aren't in the right place to get us the correct pinion angle. So I'm gonna take these top arms out and make them adjustable. So we'll get those popped out and um, start doing some lathe and milling work. In order to fix the problem with the pinion angle on the diff, I've got to make the arms, top arms adjustable so I can bring the nose of the pinion up. That's the standard scorpion arm. And I was going to use this, but then I had a look at the Sigma arm. As you can see, the Sigma arm's big, heavy duty arm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Sigma arms cut them in half and put an adjuster into the center. So with the magic of editing, that's the adjuster that I've made. It's three quarter or 19 millimeter left and right hand threads. So then I've made up these little bungs here that are gonna go inside the arm. And then by turning this, I'll be able to adjust the arm in and out. Now, through the magic of editing, is one that I prepared earlier. So that's what it looks like when it's all done. I haven't welded the, the, the ends in yet, but by turning this center piece here, I'll be able to extend and contract the arm and, uh, and get the pinion angle exactly where I want it. So I'll get this finished off, put it in the car and show you what it looks like in the car. This is the motor that's going into the Scorpion. It's a 302 Windsor, obviously. What I like to do with these second-hand motors is while it's out of the car, take the sump off and put a new set of bearing shells in it. The bearings are nearly always worn. The bores are really good because these late model engines ran a metric narrow ring set with low tension rings. So the bores are hardly ever worn in these things, which is really good. But the bearings on the other hand, they tend to start looking like that fairly soon. So what I've done is I've got a set of Marl cleavide bearings for it and put a brand new set of bearings in it. So I'll put those all on and I'll talk it up. The other thing that I like to put in is a brand new oil pump. That's a Mellings oil pump. Standard volume, you definitely do not need a high volume pump. So standard pump will do very nicely. Now, we're also going to put the early model timing case on it. So this is not just serpentine drive. This is like a, an early 302 Windsor timing case. But what I've done here is I've modified it slightly so the front plate will go on. So the flange there for the mechanical petrol pump, that's gone. And I've milled it all off flat. I've also added these three little bosses here, which makes it dead flat across the front. So when we put the front plate on, these pull up hard up against the, against the plate. So I'll get all this bolted up, get it all torqued up, we'll paint the engine and it'll be ready to go in the car. We've got our motor ready now, it's all painted up and, and so forth. Um, I've put a new timing set on it. Uh, Ford uses an inverted tooth timing set. Um, that style there. Um, what, uh, what I prefer is the, the true roller chain style. Anyway, we've got all that on there. That's the same timing case I had the other day. Uh, we've just had it coated black. Um, this is done for us by e uh, Steve at East Coast Coatings. Uh, it's a black coating. It's not powder coat. It's some sort of chemical coating that is petrol resistant, chemical resistant, everything. Uh, and it doesn't come off aluminium. Uh, I've painted these in the past, but you know, you have problems with getting the paint to stick to, to aluminium. So that's ready to go. We'll get that bolted on and then I can put the front plate on. Now, your standard Blake model Windsor sump has the dipstick in the side of the sump and they always leak. I don't think I've seen one of these late model motors without a big oil stain running down the side. And it's because of the little O-ring that goes in there fails. 
So what I like to do is to drill and tap the hole and screw a one, a one quarter NPT plug into the hole. Uh, you put some Loctite sealant on it and that seals it up for, for good. So that's going to happen there. And then of course we put the dipstick into the timing case. These Erdelmoller timing cases have got a, a hole in them for the dipstick. So the dipstick will come up the, the front of the engine like the early model did. So I'll get all of that bolted together. We'll put the gearbox on it and get it into the car. These late model motors, I think it's EL Falcon onwards, um, came with, actually it's EB onwards, came with a serpentine drive. Now this motor is going to run V-belts, so we don't want the serpentine drive. So what I've bought is a Pioneer harmonic balancer. It's the same 50 ounce balance weight and all that sort of thing, but it's got these four bolt holes in the front which just accept standard forward pulleys. So this will work really well for us. So I've got to get that mounted on onto the nose of the crank now. The only little hitch that we've got is that the original timing pointer now doesn't really work for us because it sits on top of this plate, whereas normally it would have been in quite a little bit further. So I've just started making up a new timing pointer. I've got to trim that up a little bit, but I'll get that mounted up. I'll put the pump on, I'll put all that on. I'll show you what it looks like when it's just about ready to go in the car. We've got the engine bay all painted. We've put the booster in, we've made up brake lines. The only thing left to do now is to actually bleed the brakes, we put the power steer column in and so forth. But uh, that's about it for this episode. Uh, thanks for tuning in and um, we'll see you in the next one where we put a few more bits and pieces on the car.